Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Tonight's construction catastrophe, The Children on the Stairs, by Owen Claiborne. I was doing a job for a friend of a friend. I was only charging half what I normally would, but I was doing the job over just two nights, meaning that I wouldn't make too much of a loss. There wasn't a lot in the way of material outlay either. It was simple enough. Strip out the plaster in the nursery of an old house, then replaster it. I'd have my mate with me so it wasn't too big of a job. I could have done it in a single day and night, but it was better to say two nights just in case. When I saw the place, the first thing in my head was why do they want only one room replastered? I hadn't met the owner, otherwise I might have asked. The whole place was falling down. Total disaster if you ask me, though it would have been a grand old building if it was done up properly. As it turned out, I ended up needing both nights after all. My mate Charlie left after the first night, but I'll get around to that in a minute. There was a story about this house, though I wasn't sure at first if it was true or not. The story went that a family had lived there some time before the Second World War, a family with four children. One night, the father had come home from his job at the bank to find a silent house. He called out to his wife and kids, but there was no answer. On going up the stairs to the nursery, the man found a bloodbath. The floor, the walls, even the ceiling, everything was thick with blood, and in the middle of the floor, a jumble of bloody limbs and torsos. The mother was nowhere to be found. The father, in his grief, hanged himself from a tree in the park across the road. The strangest part was when the police arrived, they couldn't find any of the children's heads. But like I say, this was a long time ago, before the war, and it was just a story that people told around there. The house had been lived in until recently, or so I understood, but I couldn't tell you who had lived there. Now, about Charlie. He's a big bloke and not the sort of a person you'd picture getting scared over nothing. But that first night, around 10.30 p.m., he suddenly stopped, still as a statue, the rotten plaster board shaking in his hands. Did you hear that? What? Like, like feet running up and down the stairs. No. It was. It was feet running on the stairs. I didn't hear anything, Charlie. I thought about teasing him, but I stopped myself. Like I said, he's a big bloke and doesn't really have much of a sense of humor. Little feet, he said, carefully putting down the plasterboard. Then Charlie walks over to the front door, looks out. You're not thinking about that story, are you? I asked. His head whips around. What story? Nothing. What happened here, Bill? Something happened here, didn't it? Something bad. The landing was dark. I could see the top of the lower staircase, the ivory ball on the newel post connected to the mahogany banister, the deep shadow of the stairwell, and the bottom step of the upper flight of stairs. The rest was dark. Little feet, Charlie muttered. Without saying another word, he bolts out the room, whacks the light switch at the top of the stairs, flooding the scene with light, and then gallops down the steps, almost flying down them. I heard the front door crash open, and that was the last of Charlie that I saw for a very long time. He hadn't bothered to shut the front door, so I went down and shut it for him. Then, when I went back up the stairs, I swore under my breath, shook my head, and got back to work. The second night was tougher going. I should have been back there during the day, but it was my wife's birthday, and I had driven her to a spa out in Hemel Hempstead and had to wait around to drive her back again. In the end, I finally got to the place around 10pm, annoyed at putting the extra pressure on myself, knowing that plaster was 
best applied during the day. The room was just as I had left it. All the old wallboards were gone, the new ones were up, seams taped, wooden battens nailed in place. I got the buckets, started mixing the undercoat. It was around 2 a.m., I was almost finished skimming the last section. The battens had been removed and lay in a pile in one corner. Now, it might have been the coffee, but I was feeling a little edgy and thought I heard the ceiling creak overhead. I got back on with skimming the plaster down and thought nothing of it, but then I heard the ceiling creak again. I told myself that it was an old house, the floorboards were warped, but that didn't do anything to calm my nerves. About 2.20 a.m., something made me go out onto the landing. While I was standing there, holding my breath, trowel shaking in my hand, my eyes fell on the ivory balls on the newel posts. There were two of them on the landing, as well as the one at the top of the upper flight and the one at the end of the lower flight. Four of them, all together. And with a decorator's eye, I began absentmindedly to compare the two on the landing. They weren't identical, and that started to bother me a little. As I got closer to them, I realized two things. First, there were very fine zigzagged lines running across them. And second, that they weren't quite the right color to be ivory. The ceiling creaked again, loudly. Then I ran down the stairs, just as Charlie had done the night before, and sprinted down the street to my van. I had my phone pressed to my ear even as I turned the key in the ignition. Something moved in the nursery window. What service do you require? Hello? It took me a moment to catch my breath. I want to report some human remains, I said. So remember, folks, sometimes people consider the house part of the family. But when they start to make the family part of the house, it's time to nope the hell out. Stay scary, my wildlings. Always remember where the exits are and make the most of your nights. <laughs>